we can handle it. John hoped he sounded more certain than he felt. On the one hand, he and his fellow Spartans were the deadliest soldiers mankind had ever created. On the other, humanity had not even been certain that aliens really existed until the violent first contact with the Covenant. So there was no getting around it. At best, John and his assault squad were only somewhat prepared for what they were about to attempt. But he didn't dare admit that. If he wanted his team to fight with confidence, he had to project confidence at all times. When Ascot did not respond to his reassurance, John decided to double down. Really, ma'am, we'll be fine. Spartans work fast. Nobody works that fast, Ascot said. Look, you'll have no more than a 15-minute margin. If anyone runs out of air during the boarding action, there's nothing the Starry Knight can do to help. I appreciate the concern. John did not let her caution shake him. The Spartan II program was so highly classified that even Prowler captains did not know the full capabilities of the super soldiers they ferried into battle. But once we're aboard, rebreather time won't be a factor. The mothership's atmosphere should support human life. There's a big difference between should and will. The odds are with us. You've seen the intelligence summaries. Only one Covenant species doesn't breathe oxygen. Only one species that Oni is aware of, Ascot replied. We both know there could be a dozen more that breathe anything from hydrogen to cobalt. The UNSC has a lot to learn about the Covenant. Yes, ma'am. That is the reason for the operation. Careful, Spartan, Ascot said. A pissed-off prowler captain has about 200 ways to make your life miserable. I apologize, ma'am. John didn't like begging for permission to carry out a mission assigned to him by the chief of the Office of Naval Intelligence's Section 3. But as the commander of the Starry Night, Ascot was in charge of the mission until the Spartans left her vessel. I still think we need to take the risk. I know you do. Ascot's tone was sympathetic. The UNSC knew almost nothing about the enemy. If the Spartans could capture a Covenant vessel, the scientists of Oni's Section 3 Materials Group should be able to reverse-engineer the technology and learn the secret of the enemy's superior slipspace drives and nearly impenetrable energy shields. They would also attempt to discover the true capabilities of the aliens' advanced weaponry and perhaps even uncover a few hidden vulnerabilities. With a little luck, they might even figure out where the aliens lived out there and why they wanted to eradicate humanity. But it's my call, Ascot continued, and I need to be sure you understand the risks. We're working at the edge of your armor's capability and with more unknown variables than we can count. If something goes wrong, there won't be much chance to recover. If you're saying we'd be on our own, Spartans are trained. I'm saying the Starry Knight will do everything possible, Ascot said but we're limited by orbital mechanics. It might be smart to wait for an opportunity that's not quite so marginal. With all due respect, ma'am, I disagree. As much as John wanted to accept her recommendation, he didn't even consider it. The longer they waited, the more likely they were to run into a mission-killing complication, and the more his private doubts would eat away at him. We've been here a day already, and our luck won't hold forever. Sooner or later, an enemy patrol will spot the Starry Night, or a Second Covenant vessel will arrive, or the enemy commander will decide it's time to move on. I can think of a dozen things that might go wrong if we don't go now. Ascot fell silent for a moment, and then finally sighed, So can I. There was a low murmur while she consulted with someone on the bridge, and then she said, Very well, Spartan, you're cleared to move forward. Slingshot maneuver in five minutes. Affirmative, John said. And thanks. Don't thank me, son. This isn't a favor. She closed the comm channel, leaving John to hope he was making a sound decision. His best friend, Samuel 034, had died a few months earlier during the boarding action that had inspired this one, and John was still trying to figure out what had gone wrong. The UNSC's entire complement of Spartans had been aboard a modified Pelican dropship, ascending toward an orbital rendezvous above Kai Seti 4 when they spotted a Covenant warship moving to attack their transport frigate. The vessels had savaged each other earlier, and it was clear the UNSC frigate would not survive another engagement. John ordered the company to go EVA and board the enemy ship. He told himself he had no choice. 
that the desperate assault was the only way to prevent all 33 Spartans from being trapped on a soon-to-be-occupied world, and that had probably been true. But the whole reason for going to Kai City 4 had been to outfit the Spartans in their new state-of-the-art Mjolnir power armor, the automatic neural interface, performance-amplifying circuitry, and titanium alloy shell had made them feel almost invincible, and John had been as keen as anyone to test the new armor in action. So when the Covenant ship reappeared, he hadn't hesitated to commit his entire force to an impromptu boarding action. The risky attack had worked, though just barely. John and his two companions, Samuel 034 and Kelly 087, had intercepted the vessel and boarded through a breach in the combat-battered hull. They had managed to plant a trio of Anvil II warheads near a power core, but not before a lucky plasma bolt found a soft spot in Sam's armor and ruptured the pressure seal beneath. The only way to flee the ship had been to jump back into space, where Sam would decompress inside his armor. Rather than condemn his friend to such a slow and agonizing death, John had ordered Sam to stay behind and guard the warheads until they detonated. The decision continued to haunt John in his dreams, and that troubled him. He had seen many soldiers die, both in training and in combat, and suffered no self-doubt. But Sam had been under his command, and John could not help believing that had he been better prepared and not quite so reckless, his friend would be fighting at his side today. John still didn't see what he could have done differently. There had been only moments to plan and no opportunity to marshal ordnance, but he was not about to make the same mistake twice. This time, the Spartans were carrying emergency patching kits and extra thruster packs and locator beacons, equipment for just about every foreseeable contingency. And still he worried. Thanks to the UNSC's lack of knowledge about the enemy, almost literally John was leading his Spartans into battle blind, and everything in his training told him that was a recipe for disaster. But they had to try. John turned toward the interior of the drop bay. Including him, there were 12 Spartans prepared to launch, all looking vaguely robotic in their angular helmets and bulky Mjolnir power armor. In an effort to optimize each Spartan's individual field competencies and test skunkwork modifications, their armor's titanium alloy frame had been temporarily modified, each of them bearing distinctive features. And to avoid enemy sensors, their plating sets had been tinted with the same refractive coating that helped conceal the UNSC's prowlers. Whether the precaution would work against the aliens was little more than an educated guess. The only thing the UNSC knew about Covenant sensor technology was that in the active mode, it radiated across a broad array of the electromagnetic spectrum. In theory, the apparatus had to operate on the same general principle as human sensor systems, by emitting a signal and looking for reflections bounced off an unseen object. But that was really just an assumption. For all anyone in the UNSC knew, the alien transmissions could be the byproduct of some quantum scanning technology that humanity had not yet imagined. Another good reason to capture an enemy ship. The illumination in the drop bay dimmed from white to pale purple, an indication that the starry night was three minutes from start of maneuver. The darker light would be less noticeable when the jump hatch opened to discharge the Spartans, and the time buffer gave their eyes a chance to adjust to the darkness. Final check, everyone, John said. 